half of the Stanford program in Law and Society, would like to welcome to our first symposium, which is called Constitutional Innovation, Human Rights, and Public Interest Litigation in the Global South. So before starting, I would like to say a few words about our program. The Stanford program in Law and Society was created a few years ago, and it's a student-run program aimed at promoting and advancing social legal interdisciplinary scholarship. This program showcases Stanford Law School leading law and society research and raises awareness of law and society as a rigorous discipline in the analysis of law in the broader social context. So we will have two panels today, uh, but before introducing the first panel, I would like to invite our faculty sponsor, Professor Lawrence Freeman, who will provide some uh, opening words to this uh, symposium. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and I'll say very few words because no one has ever criticized it being too brief. Um, uh, and Diego told you about the Law and Society program. We're very, we're very proud of it. We're very pleased with it. And we're particularly pleased with it because uh, it's not only interdisciplinary, but it's very global. Two directors, the student directors, Diego and Agnes Chong, who came here, is from Australia. So we, we really we have the whole panel you know, today. We have people from various countries, including India, later on. So we are global, we are global. So Law and Society movement is really about 50 years old or so, and I think it's been quite successful. The Law and Society Association, which we meet in Boston, uh, we have about 2,000 people attending. And one of the interesting things about this association is that over the years, it's gradually become more international. So now about 25% of the people who attend will come from outside the United States. And this is um, this has an impact not only. Uh, well, uh, they have an impact, but also uh, the Americans benefit from this. Uh, knowledge that, you know, we live really now in one world. It's a world which is more and more tied together in all sorts of ways. I don't have to tell you about that. Uh, law and society research, however, uh, that's comparative, is relatively rare and relatively recent. When I say comparative, you understand that it's very difficult to do law and society research in any one country because it's so hard to understand the, the way the law actually works in any one country. And then if you start multiplying countries, it, it increases I think, geometrically the difficulties. So it, it's for, in the light of when the difficulty of doing this research becomes even more important to hear voices from various countries. So I'm particularly pleased with this panel, these panels that we have today, and kind of the direction in which the whole group is going. Next week, for example, there will be a documentary movie show, which deals with issues in Israel, and there are other uh, that, that's about the last one. This we we'll have one more on um, psychology and law. On psychology and law. And then, of course, next year there will be an even richer program. Anyway, uh, that's enough. Uh, without further ado, would you like to leave it and use the panel? Yes, I'm going to use it. Okay. Uh, Professor Friedman. So the first panel is titled New Trends in Public Interest Litigation in Latin America. We have two wonderful speakers. Uh, first, uh, Emeraldo Lamprea, who is an assistant professor at Los Angeles University Law School in Bogota. He is finishing his JSD here at Stanford and his research centers on social family rights and educational litigation, comparative health care systems, and empirical studies on administrative law. Uh, his dissertation, which Part of it will be presented today investigates the impact of health care reform in the emergence of right to health litigation in middle income countries like Brazil, Colombia, and Costa Rica. Uh, after Everaldo, Manuel Gomez will present 
Manuel is an associate professor of law at Florida International University. He completed his PhD here at Stanford. He conducts research on uh, social networks, dispute resolution, international arbitration, and institutional reforms in Latin America. Uh, before joining Florida International University, he was a lecturer in law and a teaching fellow at Stanford Law School. And we're also very pleased to have Professor Bill Simon with us. He will be the discussant of this panel. Professor Simon is the Arthur Levy Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. He was a member of the Stanford faculty from 1981 to 2003. He has been a visiting professor here at Harvard and at UC Berkeley Law School. And he is a terrific scholar and has written extensively in the fields of professional responsibility and social policy. So each panelist we have about uh, 15 uh, to 20 minutes to present, and then uh, we will turn over to Professor Simon, who will provide comments on the presentation in about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will open the session for the Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to start experimentalism in Latin America. Uh, well, it works. Let's go. Oh, but let's go. So the two um, categories or concepts that I'm going to use today in this presentation are experimental judicial remedies and destabilization rights. So what we talk about when we talk about this uh, in, a, in, a, in a paper that is already a classic book of what it was written in 2004, professors uh, say and Simon define experimental judicial remedies uh, as uh, an approach to public law remedies that abandon, stop down, command and control judicial decrees and, quote, emphasizes uh, ongoing stakeholder negotiation, continuously revised performance measures and transparency, end of quote. Uh, and by destabilization rights, uh, Rekindling a concept first uh, introduced by Brazilian legal scholar Roberto Mangabeira Unger, they, uh, Professor Sable and Simon, define this type of rights as those that courts enforce to, quote, unsettle a public institution when, first, it is failing to satisfy minimum standards of adequate performance, and second, when it is substantially immune from conventional political mechanisms of correction. So, uh, Professor uh, Simon and Professor Sable and uh, the literature that has uh, come from this uh, breakthrough um, have studied how in the U.S. in some areas such as housing, uh, healthcare facilities, um, schools, uh, etc., federal and local courts have implemented this type of judicial remedies and have uh, used rights as destabilizing mechanisms to nudge uh, agencies in the direction of reform. Uh, my presentation studies two Latin American cases that have also adopted this type of strategies. And I am just going to go through these two cases as fast as possible and then I am going to do a little uh, something more controversial, controversial is trying to present using part of my fieldwork what are the unintended effects of this type of approach of destabilization rights and of experimental judicial remedies within courts. What happens within courts when courts go about uh, adjudicating uh, using um, experimental judicial approaches? So let's turn to this first Argentinian case, the Riachuelo eh, Matanza case. Eh, this case was decided by the Supreme Court. It can be defined as an environmental case. This is the river basin of uh, Riachuelo eh, 
This here is Buenos Aires, the province of Buenos Aires, and the river cuts the whole province. Although it is uh, a somehow small river basin, it is really important because uh, it cuts the whole province of Buenos Aires, which is one of the most populated areas in Buenos Aires. The history of contamination of this river is very old, at least since the 19th century, Argentinians have been involved in uh, cleaning up the river basin. Prior to the current efforts of cleaning up Riachuelo, uh, in 1993 there was a breakthrough, or what seemed to be a breakthrough at the time, during uh, Menem's government, the Inter-American Development Bank, loaned Argentina $250 million to clean up the Riachuelo Basin, of which $150 million have gone to other projects. $7 million to consultants, $6 million to fines for not using the money correctly, and $1 million on the river itself. <laughs> uh, the remaining money has yet to be allocated. So the story of, of the cleanup of this river is not very brilliant, indeed. Uh, until uh, 2004, uh, when the uh, residents of the uh, Riachuelo Basin filed a class action against the federal and the provincial governmental agencies and against 44 factories and businesses to uh, demand the cleanup of the basin and also uh, to demand reparations for health damages caused by the pollution. This is the Argentinian Supreme Court. Uh, what is interesting about this ruling uh, for this presentation is that the court uh, decided not to hand down a decision that uh, established top-down command and control remedies which detailed uh, what the government was supposed to do to clean up the, the basin. Instead, the court uh, created a, a deliberative scheme uh, in which uh, the court has hosted four public hearings in which plaintiffs uh, defendants, but also governmental agencies, NGOs, and experts have come together to discuss the government's plan to clean up the base. Uh, this plan has been deliberated. Uh, it has been reshaped, so the court doesn't expect the plan to be written in stone. However, in 2008, the court, the Supreme Court, adopted a more aggressive and destabilizing stance, uh, and it asked for the implementation of a more strict and detailed um, timeline and a set of goals to be achieved. Additionally, it commissioned a local court and the public attorney's office to monitor the implementation of the plan to clean up. Uh, what are the results of this process of um, uh, experimental judicial making? Well, um, there is a mixed spread. Um, in this ruling, uh, the Supreme Court asked to uh, improve the quality, the environmental quality of the basin. So what has been accomplished uh, is, according to the World Bank, a 30% of the total plan initially uh, um, uh, considered by the, by the government. Um, a new agency was created by uh, the Argentinian Cross Congress to carry out the implementation of the cleanup. However, some authors and activists like Horacio Verbitsky in Argentina argue that the implementation of the follow-up by the local courts uh, has derailed the whole process. Uh, Verbitsky argues that local courts have been grafted uh, and have been um, penetrated by the interests of the uh, polluting factories and by the local governments. Uh, Cesar is going to discuss more about uh, uh, the effects of this type of ruling, so I'm, I'm, I will be happy to discuss this uh, in the Q&A. Uh, so let's now go to the northern part of uh, South America, let's go to Colombia to a ruling on the healthcare system. This ruling is 
called T760. That's the way these rulings are coded in Colombia. It's not very catchy, but that's the way it is. It's a 2008 ruling. So this ruling is about the regulatory collapse of Colombia's healthcare system. And it is about also uh, the growth, the escalation, uh, somehow dramatic of right to health litigation in Colombia. According to comparative uh, work, Colombia has the uh, Colombia has the highest volumes of right to health litigation among middle income countries. Uh, in 2008, one around 150,000 individuals just during that year used an injunction for the protection of basic rights introduced by the 91 Constitution to demand access or the delivery of a healthcare service such as a pharmaceutical or uh, as a, um, a medical appointment, for instance. Uh, since 1999 until today, around one million people have used this injunction to demand complete access to healthcare services. This has a positive side, of course, many people using the right to health to demand access when HMOs uh, and providers deny services, healthcare services that people have a right to. But on the uh, darker side of this picture, uh, the fiscal and the uh, financial costs of this type of litigation have been enormous in Colombia. Additionally, there is literature that explores the a positively negative impact of this type of litigation on uh, equality and on a, a fairness. Uh, Cesar can tell you a little bit more about that. But what I want you to uh, know is that this is a huge phenomenon, right to health litigation, that signals a deep dysfunction within Colombia's healthcare system. In 2008, the court the Constitutional Court, which is the highest court in the land, uh, handed down this ruling. And in this ruling, as in a similar ruling on internally displaced population that uh, we are going to hear about, the court decided not to hand down a detailed plan for the government's reform of the healthcare system that was supposed to uh, de-incentivize the growth of right to health litigation. Instead of that, the court created, as the Argentinian court did, a deliberative setting in which justices of the Constitutional Court, governmental agencies in charge of uh, administering the healthcare system, such as the Minister of Health or health regulatory agencies, came together with uh, governmental agencies such as the Public Attorney's Office, the uh, uh, attorneys of the Criminal attorney, Attorney's Office, civil society organizations, patients associations, and the academia, they came together in several public hearings to discuss the government's plan to implement healthcare reform. Uh, also, Congress members. So, when we talk about this type of judicial experimentalism, we can talk about expected and unexpected effects. So, the Constitutional Court in Colombia has used, in this case of healthcare reform, six, type, six types of uh, strategies to destabilize governmental agencies in order to nudge them in the direction of healthcare reform. And what are these strategies? Well, public hearings, as I was just mentioning, panels with experts in which the court engages with uh, the most prominent experts on the healthcare system in order to acquire information and knowledge about the type of plan that the government is implementing that sometimes is packed with technicalities and with a very complex public health and financial issues. Uh, meetings with interest groups hosted by the court, by the Constitutional Court, in which the court tries to hear all sides of the spectrum involved in the compliance with the ruling. Uh, additionally, the, the court created a panel that is called the follow-up panel that is in charge of following the compliance of these a structural ruling. Uh, the court has issued several compliance rulings in which it has determined whether the government is complying or not with the plan. And finally, interaction with public servants in more informal settings. So the uh, 
expected effects of these type of strategies uh, have been mostly positive. The government has implemented several structural reforms of the healthcare system. Uh, currently, the Minister of Health is conducting a major healthcare reform that is based on the idea of a basic right to health, and this has been the product of the court's inter intervention. Uh, but in my fieldwork, I worked as a clerk at the court, and meanwhile, I was uh, conducting my fieldwork uh, as part of this follow-up panel. And one of the results of my fieldwork indicate that the literature on um, experimental uh, judicial remedies and um, destabilization rights does not account for the effects of this type of uh, judicial activity within the courts. So briefly, uh, I am just going to go through one of the several of the effects that I um, uh, encountered in my fieldwork. First, informational asymmetries within the court. Uh, most of my uh, teammates were really worried about the asymmetry between the court and the Minister of Health, for instance, or regulatory agencies. When the court tried to push these governmental agencies to implement complex uh, policies on the healthcare system, of course, the court was not well endowed to understand what was what was at stake. Uh, epidemiological issues, uh, macroeconomical issues surrounding healthcare reform. Of course, uh, the Minister of Health has uh, large bodies of technocrats and specialists that have the upper hand over the court. So this is a problem that we face. Also, polycentric questions, this is a way of saying that the effect that the court believes has a policy uh, maybe has more than one effect. Multiple effects that the court cannot describe, predict, or ask for reform. Separation of powers issues. Uh, within the court, there are several justices and clerks who are worried about uh, the possible bending of the separation of powers when the court asks governmental agencies to implement policy and uses several pathways such as public hearings or experts meetings. Some people really worry about courts overstepping here the uh, uh, rule of law. Political hijacking, additionally, when the court opens it do its doors to civil society organizations, experts, governmental experts, etc. There is the possibility of a Troy horse there, of people getting into the court, opening the black box of the court, and uh, doing politics within the court. Also the lack of closure of this follow-up process. When in 2008 the court handed down this decision, uh, it was expected from the government to implement policy to solve the crisis of the healthcare system. But some justices of the court and clerks ask this very reasonable question. When does it stop? Uh, so this lack of closure is very problematic for some people. Also the participatory deficit. And when the court opened its doors to the participation of experts and civil society organizations, it left some people out. Uh, if you invite expert X, why not invite expert Y? If you invite some civil society organization, what happens with the other civil society organizations. So there was like deep criticism against the court for its decision to invite people and exclude others. Uh, and finally, a whole of hope uh, uh, possibility here that the court created this huge expectation about the transformative uh, possibilities of judicial experimentalism and of destabilization rights, and at the end of the day, probably the government has the upper hand, or politics change dramatically and the court is uh, behind the curve, etc. So, within the court, some people worry about creating like a hollow hope within civil society organizations, which may lead to the court's uh, loss of uh, confidence by uh, Colombian civil society. Uh, of course, just to close here, um, 
my conclusion in, in the dissertation is that this intervention has been mostly positive. It has created um, awareness about the healthcare system's uh, problems and it has nudged governmental agencies in the direction of reform. However, we have to study more and do more empirical work on what happens when courts decide to go through uh, experimental judicial remedies and to destabilization rights. So, thanks. Uh, it turned out to, 
towards the, the last decade of the operations, Texaco only had a third of the interest in the joint venture, and the government of Ecuador had two thirds of interest in the joint venture. But no one really sued the government of Ecuador. Plaintiffs went against uh, the deep pocket uh, corporation. So the corporation at the time, uh, Texaco, asserted that Ecuador was a suitable uh, jurisdiction that even though plaintiffs did not have standing under Ecuadorian law for the protection of the environment, so there were many, many uh, allegations, some of them had to do with public interest type of, of allegations, the protection of the environment, even human rights uh, type of allegations, which are not unusual in this type of, of litigations that you see, where you see all this, this bundle of, of different private and public rights, uh, also personal injury, and so on and so forth. So at the time, uh, in order to convince the court that it should dismiss the case, uh, the argument was Ecuador is suitable, is adequate, is more than adequate. This is an old, a whole Ecuadorian issue. And uh, although parties may not pursue a representative litigation such as class action, they're able to, do, to use the joinder, because joinder is possible uh, in Ecuador. So they asked the court to dismiss it. And the court said, OK, I will dismiss it if you promise, or if, you know, the stipulation will be that you will not contest the jurisdiction of the Ecuadorian courts. Uh, Texaco said, fine, that's, that's perfectly fine. And if there is a, ju a, a judgment rendered against you, you're not going to fight, uh, fight, say, fine. There was some, some interesting language there. What happened is upon dismissal, a year later, in 2000, Aguinda and others filed a lawsuit in Ecuador in a provincial court of Sucumbíos, which is a, a, a small uh, court in the, in the town of Lago Agri. Lago Agri in English means Sour Lake. And uh, that also depicts the connection, the close connection between Texaco and that region of the Amazonian, of the Ecuadorian Amazon. Sour Lake is the name of the town in Texas where, where Texaco was first uh, first started its operations a long, long time ago. So that's the, the town, the town's Lago Agri is, is the, the, probably the sister town of, of Sour Lake, uh, Texas. Just a little uh, interesting anecdote there. So the case was filed not against Texaco, but against Chevron. Why, you might ask, why? Because uh, in 2001, Chevron had merged with Texaco. Uh, at least the, the filings with the SEC in the United States uh, spoke about a, a merger. Uh, to this day, Chevron contests that, that any such merger took place and have said this, that it was a different type of, uh, of operation. It was the acquisition of assets. Uh, we're not the, the, the successors in the interest of, of Texaco, but to the Ecuadorian judge who said, eh, this is a merger, to, looks like a merger to me, and I will treat it as a merger, and, uh, and I will uh, pierce the corporate veil of this whole thing, because I think we're the same entity, which is really, really an interesting development for an Ecuadorian court, because although the, the doctrine of, of corporate deals, uh, pierce, uh, veil piercing, piercing is, is commonly used, and widely known in the United States, it's not so much known in Latin America. So after several years of litigation, and I, I must add something, litigation, the lawsuit, the new lawsuit was possible in Ecuador because in 1999, Ecuador had passed a statute, this is a very important development, known as the Environmental Management Act, and this statute in, in Article 43 had a provision that is a very, very important provision for those of us who are interested in studying collective litigation in Latin America that gave standing to private citizens to uh, file claims for the protection of diffuse rights. And diffuse rights are those rights that belong to the community as a whole, may not be divided. Uh, this is not personal compensation or compensation, monetary compensation arising from personal injury claims, but more for uh, com compensation to seek compensation arising out of damages to the environment. So it gave standing to these individuals 
a, there is also a contention in the, well, in, in the court. Chairman had asserted that this law had been tailored made for the litigation. They say, well, this is not a coincidence that this law was passed. But if we look at the broader picture, we'll never know if that's true. What we know is that there is, you know, there are lobbyists all over the world uh, trying to pursue a certain uh, type of legislation, and, and there's an equal amount of, of people trying to, to go against it. But what we know, if we look at the larger picture of collective the development of collective litigation in Latin America, shows that this is this is a natural progression of things in the region. So the Environmental Management Act might have been the result of heavy lobbying on fa in the favor of, of, of the cause of this specific, or having this specific case in mind, which is not foreign to, to the U.S. either, uh, but it was certainly reflective of a trend that had been taking place in Latin America. So Aida and others kept standing because of the Environmental Protection Act or the Environmental Management Act. The outcome, we fast forward to 2011. In 2011, the Provincial Court of Supervillos issued a judgment against Chevron and found four plaintiffs and uh, ordered Chevron to pay almost $19 billion. Uh, and the judgment was, was unprecedented in many ways. Number one, because it's the largest judgment I'm sure that court had ever issued. Uh, it was also the largest uh, judgment against a multinational company in Ecuador. And it, probably the, it is probably the largest judgment any Latin American court has issued against a Latin American, uh, a foreign company or any company whatsoever. But the judgment had two components. Half of it was in the form of punitive damages, uh, which was very unusual in Ecuador and, and in most of Latin America. And, uh, and the punitive damages were conditioned to a public apology that Chevron had to issue 15 days after the, the judgment would become final. And it's not hard to predict that Chevron is not going to apologize. They issued a statement instead saying, if we apologize, it means that we are agreeing to everything that the judgment has said, and we're planning on appealing this, and uh, they didn't apologize. So the court said, well, you didn't apologize, now you have to pay the whole sum. So the, a, a recognition and enforcement of that judgment, of course, Chevron did not have any assets in Ecuador. Plaintiffs knew that before they filed lawsuit in Ecuador. It, it, Texaco had not had, you know, they didn't have any assets either. It, so they filed this lawsuit in Ecuador, knowing that they were not going to enforce this lawsuit in Ecuador. And that is in itself a really interesting trend, or a really interesting signal that we might, you know, just put it in the list. And I'm, I'm just going to conclude in a few minutes with what I think, which what I, with what I think are the are the, the pointers, or the lessons from this litigation, just to look uh, forward. So litigation taking place in one jurisdiction, and the parties knew that it was not going to be enforced in that jurisdiction. Until this day, their enforcement, recognition and enforcement actions in three jurisdictions outside of Ecuador. One is in Canada, uh, the, the Superior Court of Ontario in Canada last week ruled for Chevron saying that Canada doesn't have jurisdiction, that this, this belongs somewhere else. Uh, the Brazilian uh, courts have not decided yet. Uh, there is an interim measure in Argentina. Uh, for in favor of, of Lago Agro plaintiffs, uh, and there might be some some recognition and enforcement uh, request in Colombia at some time, sometime soon. At least the parties have announced that. So, what are the interesting aspects here? So, number one is standing. What happened in 1999 in Ecuador with the passage of the Environmental Management Act? was unprecedented in Ecuador and in many other Latin American countries, but it was also reflective of a trend towards the protection of diffused rights, as this type of rights have been defined outside of the United States. And that was very important in itself. What might happen in the future, regardless of 
of the case. There, is a, there are scandals uh, involving this case. There are allegations of corruption. Uh, there is a RICO lawsuit that was filed in the United States right before the Ecuadorian judgment was, was, was handed down. And the RICO, uh, the RICO claim is, uh, was filed against the plaintiffs and everybody else involved. Um, there are arbitration proceedings and, and investment arbitration for, before investment arbitration tribunals, there are administrative proceedings and so on. So this is not going to go away anytime soon. But at least it has opened the doors for uh, collective uh, litigation in Ecuador. It has also opened the door for thinking about punitive damages in Ecuador. Uh, this condition of punitive damages may not stand in uh, in the in Ecuador or outside of Ecuador, but it's you know still to be seen. Another aspect that is really important to note is that the court, the Ecuadorian court, devised a mechanism to fulfill the judgment. It was not explicit enough, which is to me, I call it the missed opportunity, or what could have been but never was, because. If you read the judgment, the, the judgment is, is almost a hundred page, uh, 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 almost a long, hundred page judgment, long judgment, but it doesn't really describe in, de the, in detail how the, the com how compliance or how the monies are going to be dispersed, and that is a problem that not only an Ecuadorian court would have, but also the Brazilian court or the Canadian court, if if the plaintiffs ever prevail in Canada, is. How is it that these monies are going to be dispersed? What the Ecuadorian court mentions is that a, an entity formed actually by plaintiffs called the Ecuadorian Defense Front, the Front of the Defense of the, the, the Amazon, actually, the, the Amazon Defense Front, is to be the trustee of both accounts. Number one, the account for damages, the, nine million, the, the first $9 billion and number two, the punitive damages. But the court doesn't really say, what is it that the, the Amazon Defense Front is going to do with this money? How is it that the Amazon De Defense Front is going to help correct the environmental degradation? And how is it that it's going to benefit the community? And how is it that it's going to create all this human rights problems? One more thing before I end, and this, is, has, this hasn't ended, so this is an ongoing thing. So, so one thing before I end. Before the, the second wave of litigation started in Ecuador, Texaco had set with the government of Ecuador. Remember that when I started, I said, before 1999, the standing to protect the environment was in the hands of the government of Ecuador. So the government of Ecuador had settled with Texaco at the time. And as part of those remediation, uh, there was a remediation program as part of the settlement, and that remediation program did contain some specific steps to towards a remediation and towards a solution. It was it was like a, 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 a it was a settlement agreement, an out-of-court settlement agreement that had all these steps. And uh, at the end of the period that the parties had agreed in their settlement, the government had given a release to Texaco, saying that yeah, Texaco has fulfilled its part of the agreement, and. Uh, and then when the second wave of litigation started, the chairman brought the release and said, well, we have no standing here because we're not successors in interest of Texaco. But if we are, there is a release there. The court said, well, that release covers the government, but that release does not cover the individuals who are representing the class or representing the, the entire community. So there is a lot of uh, a discussion to have about this. I just wanted to to lay out the, the main issues, and thank you very much.
more optimistic about the experimentalist activity in Argentina and in Colombia, the structure of the Rito Yemena, the Ecuadorian uh, situation, but uh, it's certainly they're, they're, they're both fascinating. They're all fascinating sets of developments. Now, I, I view the, um, the structural relief cases that Evaldo talked about as very different from the collective damage cases that um, Manuel talked about. Uh, but let, let me just make a few comments about uh, each of them in that uh, order. So, in the structural relief cases, the distinctive characteristic of relief here is responsible to the justiciability problem that people always assert in connection with social and economic rights, which is that the, it's hard for the court to define with any precision in any you know, reason way that uh, employs recognized legal methodology uh, to start with a very abstract premise and then to re reason to a particular uh, con consequence. Um, now, the solution to that, the response to that in these structural cases is that the court starts out not by defining the right with what the right should be with precision, but def by defining the status quo as unacceptable. Right? So it may be the case that even if the court can't say what the precise duty of the government is, it can assess the situation and say this situation is non-compliant, is not right. And then where does the court go from there? Well, that's the destabilization idea, or another variation uh, term that's about used is the penalty default idea, right? So the court says, uh, we're not going to tell you exactly what you're going to do, but we're going to tell you the existing situation is unacceptable, and we are going to create a penalty that will apply to the defendants in order to induce them to engage more intensively with the plaintiffs in a way that is transparent and publicly accountable to formulate a plan. So that substantively, we're going to impose procedural requirements and we're going to impose sanctions to back them up, but substantively, what the right turns out to be will be decided in the course of these deliberative engagements by the stakeholders. And then the court adopts the plan. Of course, the plan has to, as well as says, the plan has to, should ideally include timetables, benchmarks, and some process for monitoring compliance and also for reassessing in an ongoing way, in a way that is both generally transparent and that incorporates the stakeholders, the plaintiffs certainly, but other stakeholders as um, other stakeholders as well. Um, now, I mean, I'm, I'm waiting to, when I get my opportunity in the Q&A, the first thing I'm going to ask Everaldo is, um, what, what is it that happened that people think allowed the capture of the courts, right? Why did the, um, why did the ideal scenario work out in which the parties uh, all sign off on some plausible, um, uh, plausible scenario? Why, do, why were certain stakeholders dominant over others? But I will say that theoretically there is, you know, there is a problem here. One can see one way in which things could go wrong. So from the court's perspective, the court doesn't know exactly what the outcome should be. So the court wants the parties to negotiate an outcome. On the other hand, the part the court wants, uh, the court presumably has to destabilize. So it has to provide a coercive incentive for the currently empowered parties to negotiate with the currently disempowered. So the court's problem is to calculate the incentive in a way that will move the defendant to engage seriously with the other stakeholders, but won't <coughs> over-empower the other stakeholders so that they can behave in an inappropriate or opportunistic way. So one could say maybe the most extreme um, uh, empowerment of this, the, the plaintiffs would be the plaintiffs have a veto right. right. We're basically going to sanction the defendant, the executives, maybe we'll put them in jail, maybe we'll find them, uh, maybe we'll shut down their office. Um, that's the penalty default idea. Right? We don't really want to implement the sanction, we just want to use that as an inducement to uh, prompt the engagement. Uh, then we, uh, uh, but we uh, so the most extreme would be, we're going to apply this penalty unless you negotiate an agreement that is acceptable to the plaintiffs. Right? Now, that would over -empower. Uh, the plaintiffs in many situations, right? The plaintiffs could be completely, uh, uh, completely unreasonable. So usually we leave it vague, right? We usually leave vague 
exactly how, uh, how much clout the, uh, uh, the plaintiffs have or other interveners or other stakeholders that are sitting, uh, uh, sitting at, the t at the table. We want people to negotiate somewhat under the veil of uncertainty because we really want them to focus on the public goals of fixing the general problem rather than their individual strategic advantage. And actually, uncertainty can, in fact, help us do that. But it may be that the court gets the penalty wrong. It may be that the court calculates it wrong in a way that uh, under-empowers certain stakeholders and over-empowers uh, others. Um, let me just say, um, I hope Barbara Aldo will tell us more about um, some of these uh, issues that he, he, he listed as um, possible problems. Um, information asymmetry, so in, it was the first one he mentioned. One response to that, and some decrees, as everyone knows, is uh, the court will sometimes require the defendant to provide resources to the plaintiffs to have their own experts, and of course will require transparency that may prompt other civil society actors that have expertise to engage in the process. Um, the polycentric nature of the problem, of course, is an inherent feature of social and economic rights, or almost all of these structural remedies. That is, you know, we can't entirely control the effects of the remedy on collateral matters. Um, on the other hand, notice that the polycentric problem is not unique to class litigation or to structural litigation. And, um, I think it will be said initially these were new individual cases for benefits. The million claims, presumably most of them were claims for individual uh, benefits. Well, a million separate individual claims have polycentric effects, and one could argue that in the structural class content uh, uh, context, the court is actually in a better position to control those or to allow the defendant to control it because in the Structural relief conduct, the defendant can often satisfy its obligations by, after engaging with the stakeholders, giving a reasonable explanation as to why resource constraints can help certain um, arguments. Whereas in the classic individual context, if the plaintiff proves that the rule is entitled to her benefit, the defendant, the judge has no choice but to order the defendant to pay um, the benefits. Um, and again, you know, I'd say the same point for separation of powers. Um, you know, at some point, the, the, nobody thinks that it's a violation of separate powers for the court to adjudicate an individual claim for benefits under a public program. But once you have a million individual claims for public benefits under a program, uh, the court is intervening in a way that is, you know, potentially more coercive, more disruptive, more infringing on legislative and executive prerogative than in the structural context. Uh, so, um, the, you know, I should say, by the way, I, I only recently learned about these uh, Colombian cases, but um, it's very gratifying to me that the discussion of these cases in Latin America by both the judges and the academics is more sophisticated than the discussion of the case in the U.S., particularly by the judges. I mean, the judges basically say, okay, this is the case, this is what the law says, we're going to do, you know, even though we're usurping an entire agency, um, they talk about it as if they were just applying the law. If you read the uh, Supreme Court's K, uh, decision last year in the California prison case, it's all about the language of this federal statute and about you know, whether the proof satisfied the criteria of the statute. No discussion at all of the broader institutional and political issues involved in the courts uh, uh, assuming this role. Generally, when the, when the courts are cutting back and they don't like uh, institutional reform litigation, then they start talking about the court's role. But when they like that, they, talk, they, uh, they typically become very formalistic. Um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about the Latin American discussion. Now, um, Lago Arreo, um, I, I mainly know, Lago, I, I teach professional responsibility, so I mainly know the Lago Agro case as a professional responsibility case, and I mainly know it from Judge Kaplan's opinion in the collateral attack 
by Texaco, which largely just recites a lot of bad behavior by everybody um, involved, including the plaintiff's lawyers, the judges in Columbia, the particular trial judge in Columbia, the American law firm, these litigation funding operations. Um, let me, you know, I don't, um, so Manuel didn't talk about that aspect, and the, uh, I don't know enough to speak with authority on it, but let me just mention a couple of points in which, the, why I think that these large mega damage actions are a different category of activity, um, and that I don't think that the value of the injunctive cases is affected by what we think of the damage actions. Um, and I say I'm a little skeptical of the uh, damage actions. So, in the structural relief cases, we're talking about remedying an ongoing problem on a forward-looking basis by including stakeholders who were previously ex excluded in a more meaningful uh, and more meaningful way. And the incentive for the stakeholders to participate is the probability that they will contribute to the solving of a public problem, right? They, have, they may have an individual stake, but it's not necessarily the case, or even maybe commonly the case, that they're acting for some of the uh, individual benefit. In the damage action case, we're talking about a transfer of wealth based largely on the termination of past fault. And um, it seems to me this is different for a couple of reasons. First of all, the monetary stakes are potentially enormous. And, you know, as Manuel says, $18 billion is uh, maybe the largest ever, but there'll be plenty more to the extent that this case succeeds. Um, the, uh, so the, the, uh, one, one, one um, difference is the monetary stakes for the parties are enormous. Another difference is the problem of underdeveloped institutions in the monetary case. So the injunctive cases typically build on the existing political process. And sometimes you get institutional development that complements the existing development. So the idea here is that we already, the defendant is already a public organization. It's not performing well, but to some extent, the intervention of the court is designed to actually enhance. If the court's intervention works, the, the executive agency will perform better as a result of that. At the same time, the court intervention may and sometimes does contribute to the development of NGOs, civil society participants, both the plaintiffs, because the plaintiffs get resources that potentially um, empowers them and, and develops them institutionally. Other stakeholders may, so I'm told, I'm going to ask a brother about this, but I'm told that there are a bunch of NGOs in Columbia now that have developed as a result of uh, this activism. Now, in the problem with the, uh, the monetary cases um, is that we have huge monetary stakes and therefore the temptations to bad behavior are very strong. And we have relatively weak institutions and therefore the mechanisms of accountability on the actors are relatively weak, right? So we have on the plaintiff's side, we have uh, problems of accountability of lawyers to their clients. So, and I, I don't know anything about the Lago Agrio case, except there, there are a lot of allegations that the plaintiffs induced fraud, but um, with certainly it's the, uh, in the American class action cases, there are many complaints that lawyers are unaccountable and they exploit their clients. Then we also have the problem that the clients, since they're not organized independently of the class suit, usually um, we have a problem of internal accountability among the clients. Those who speak for the clients may not actually speak for the clients, and there's no strong institutional structure to it. Um, to help us deal, deal with that. Um, then, in the, context, in the international context, of course, we have potentially another institutional problem, which is simply, you know, how is Texaco going to get a fair trial in a situation in which the, now, one could say there's poetic justice, it, you know, it asked to be in Colombia, it could have been in the U.S., um, but in fact, um, uh, I don't think that moves the question that, of fairness in, in, in a situation like this. How is Columbia going to, uh, is Texaco going to get a fair trial when 
the case is being adjudicated by a judiciary that has no stake at all in fairness to Columbia and has the prospect of an $18 billion transfer to, uh, uh, to Columbia. Now, one could say, I'm not sure, you know, the US courts generally have a good reputation, but I wouldn't say you know, having a try in the US is the obvious answer either. I mean, what one might want ideally is some type of international institution to deal with uh, cases like that, but we don't have it. So that's another side of the under-institutionalization problem in these cases. So maybe the panelists can come up here and uh, so maybe we can give you five minutes to respond to the questions of Professor Simon Fox and then very brief. Uh, yeah, thank you for the comments. Uh, they are very insightful and, and interesting, and also the questions. So I'm just going to uh, briefly sketch uh, why these cases in the, in, in, in the area of socioeconomic rights, structural uh, injunction remedies, are uh, more complex than uh, initially thought. Um, you mentioned penalties. Uh, you mentioned negotiation, um, you mentioned uncertainty, and, and these elements are playing out in, in, this, um, uh, in this discussion. Let me, let me explain how. When the Constitutional Court decided to uh, hand down this decision, as you mentioned, we had behind us hundreds of thousands of individual cases. And the court steps back and says, now I'm going to produce a structural uh, uh, ruling in which we are, as court, uh, going to identify the determinants, the institutional regulatory determinants that are causing this litigation. So there are no two parties clearly identified. Uh, there is one defendant, we can say the government, but there is a diffusion of uh, plaintiffs. There is no particular set of individuals and citizens who uh, filed the lawsuit. It is the court abstracting these hundreds of thousands of cases and saying, here are the regulatory causes, now do something about it. So negotiation becomes difficult. Penalties become very difficult because at the same time when the court says, look, some of the determinants of this type of litigation are regulatory dysfunctions such as not updating the basket of healthcare services. Do something about it, but then doing something about it becomes extremely complex to determine for the court because it involves extremely uh, technical issues such as the epidemiological, epidemiological profile of the Canadian population. So the court has to determine what is like a, a reasonable uh, measure to comply with the court's orders. So then is when experts come to the fore and some of them, when I arrived at the court, I realized that a group of uh, NGOs were actually um, managing the court from inside uh, through their expertise. Their agenda was, uh, I agree with part of this organization's agenda, but they were actually playing politics within the court. So the court didn't, I mean, the court is filled with very brilliant uh, lawyers and judges, but they actually don't know much about uh, the, the epidemiological profile of the Colombian population, and they shouldn't. So they invited experts, and some of these experts were, for, the, for their first time in their lives, within the court, and they were part of this process. So. Um, indirectly, they, they play politics with the court. Um, and the polycentric effects, I, I agree with you that uh, these type of rulings have polycentric effects, but at the same time, individual rulings do have also polycentric effects. The point here is that the court uh, is not able to identify what are the effects of its own follow-up process. It doesn't know when it should stop. Uh, 
when is like a good moment to call like the uh, follow-up process complete. Um, and finally, the penalties. So insofar as this is a very complex regulatory and ongoing process, the court has a difficult time identifying when the Minister of Health, for instance, is not compliant. And uh, if the Minister of Health is not compliant, it's also very complex for the court to say something like, okay, so we are uh, putting the minister in jail. That's never going to happen. So these complexities are part of this uh, exciting and uh, fascinating process that is also a change of legal culture. Like, uh, finally, this is a point that I want to make, that the Colombian Constitutional Court has pioneered this type of structural um, uh, relief um, rulings and experimental judicial rulings, but at the same time, the prevailing legal culture in Colombia is still very classical in the sense that the Constitutional Court is supposed to decide cases on the constitutionality of a uh, laws and on individual cases. So this new way to approach constitutional adjudication is breaking away in Colombia and we need time to understand the model that we have created that uh, we have transplanted some elements of American judicial making in this area, but it's mostly uh, uh, grassroots uh, and local-based uh, legal culture transformation. Thank you. I do agree with your with your characterization of uh, of the difference that you that you that you see between injunctive cases and damage cases. Uh, and uh, and uh, some of the some of the features or the traits that you mentioned are, are, are really important. You know the issue that the, the, the point that the damage cases are, are basically about the transfer of wealth, and that transfer of wealth has these pervasive uh, effects uh, not only on government officials who see this as the, the jackpot, uh, but also on plaintiffs counsel and third party funders and, and all that. Uh, but but there are also some 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 common points. I, I, I think that there are some commonalities between uh, some of what what Everaldo mentioned, mainly towards the end when you were talking about the problems. Uh, the political hijacking of, of the process takes also place in a in a in a in a, in a, in a case such as the, the Lago Agrio, uh, because experts were also involved. So the 88 page long judgment that I mentioned. It uh, doesn't really address the scheme through which the the judgment should be complied. I don't think the, the I don't think the judge and, and this is why I called it a, a, a missed opportunity. I don't think the judge realized the implications of saying you pay nine million dollars in damages. Uh, I don't think the judge thought it thought it through in terms of okay, what's going to happen? How is it that it's going to be played out? Because th there was there was a long description on. Damages were proven, experts appointed by the court, actually the parties had this, this uh, there were this party appointed experts and no one was happy with it. Of course, plaintiff wasn't happy with defendants, defendant wasn't happy with plaintiff, and they asked the court to step in. And the court stepped in, and of course there was a lot of controversy and all the corruption allegations and who was the appointed, the court appointed expert, but there was a court appointed expert, and when you have court appointed experts in this type of cases also, when you have court appointed experts in, in Colombian cases, the experts are, are stakeholders as well because they're citizens. They're they're affected by the situation, and they're sympathetic to one of the sides, or they might not reveal the, the sympathy that they have. But that's a, that's a risk, and I think it's a common risk that you have in both injunctive and damage uh, type of cases. And another issue. Uh, that that I think is important uh, to see in the in this you know with respect to the Lago Agro. So far, what we've seen is the damage portion of it, and I don't think this is nearly the end of this. Why? Because the what might happen if the if the if the judgment is not enforceable. Say that Brazil say we're not going to enforce it. Argentina doesn't do anything meaningful, and Canada. Uh, confirms the, 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 the lack of jurisdiction of, of Canada, I think what's next for those representing plaintiffs will be probably to go after 
the government of Ecuador, which is Chevron's position so far. They have said, don't go after us. That's what Texaco was saying at the time. They said, don't go after us, go after the government as well. Uh, so that second act would probably have more resemblance to some of the issues that you see in structural uh, litigated cases, because you will have a judge, uh, we don't know if this is going to happen, but if it happens, you will have a judge revising the, the, uh, the agencies that were in charge of regulating and overseeing the, the oil exploitation activities, you will have a judge overseeing the government's conduct, and you will have a judge having you know, the ultimate decision or the ultimate solution here would be to have a judge overseeing and devising a mechanism very similar to the mechanisms that have been used in Colombia and elsewhere to address this, these larger issues. So, so I think there is, a, there is an opportunity for Ecuadorian judges, those who, who address some of these issues in the future, to learn from what's going on outside of, of Ecuador. And that might be the, if we have something like this five years from now, we might be talking about the injunctive case that came after the damage case that was not successful. Okay, so let's take a couple of questions. Okay. Can I? Is this on? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to, um, I wanted to just acknowledge a couple things over all the things that I thought were really excellent points, and it made me actually rethink something I said in response to Von Wells' paper. Um, so. Aroldo says it's a problem that the plaintiffs are underorganized. So to the extent they have a role at the table, the question is who sits there for them and who signs off for them. And of course, that's the problem I mentioned in the damage cases, right? That the under-institutionalization of that plaintiff's life. So, I mean, I want to acknowledge that this is a problem. This is also a problem on the structural side. I think not not as severe because you don't have the monetary incentives aren't motivated. Uh, selfish behavior to the extent that they are <coughs> on, the, on the damage side. And then on the, the issue about the politics within the court. Um, so um, this is kind of a fascinating question. And it is a problem, it seems to me, when the courts in administering these decrees basically turn themselves into administrative agencies, right? And that's a pathology that I think most judges would say you want to avoid, right? So the trick for the court is to not take over the program, right? First, because they don't know how to run an agency, and second, because they don't want to be on the spot for uh, the decision. So this, the, the, the trick for the court is to try to proceduralize their role, right? So their role is to orchestrate the procedure and induce participants to make the procedure work without themselves being in a position that they are making the substantive decision. Now, it's a very hard line to, uh, uh, to draw and to make, uh, to make work, but that, that's clearly the, uh, the goal of um, the guideline that they ought to follow. Okay, let's take a couple of questions. Mark. Yeah, so I'll make a, a, a question to, to each of you. Um, like Bill, I was a bit surprised on the first presentation when you threw up some of those factors like polycentricity and inf information symmetries because of, that's yeah, partly the point of, of uh, institutional reform litigation. But I'm wondering what, what, what do you think are the, the key factors uh, involved? I mean, just looking at the US literature, it, uh, it seems that if courts get involved too early in a new policy area, and there's no best practices out there, like there were, say, in the prison reform litigation, but there were not in the special education litigation, then courts can easily get the, the policy options wrong at the beginning, or if they're too inflexible with their orders, taking the whole rinse approach. I mean, I'm just wondering, what, what would you see? I mean, Bill's into this some. What would you see as the key factors? Because there's only five countries in the world that I can see that are part of this litigation. So what, what can we learn from Colombia that's different, say, from, from the US? And on Ecuador, I mean, it struck me that transnational litigation is going to be the litigation of the, the next two centuries, at least. I mean, well, you've got so many cases. I mean, and enforcement of judgments becomes a real issue now. And, but I was thinking, you've got all these cases against Latin American countries under international investment arbitration, where you've got Latin American judges very reluctant to, say, seize Argentinian airplanes and give them to, you know, French investors or whatever. But then you kind of want, on the other hand, you want, um, you know, uh, 
uh, Canadian courts and Brazilian courts to enforce judgments against multinationals. You know, an interesting thing with international investment arbitration is that when it gets to enforcement, there's no international institution. So, how do you? What's your? Because you tend to take partly a political position. How do you see see that playing out? What should be the role of, of judges in, in these cases? And I have a question to build on your on your categories, just to push back a bit, because. Some tort litigation is transformational in its objective. I'm thinking, say, for example, this, the sexual abuse litigation against pricks, because tort litigation was used to frame the issue, to, to, to push the Catholic Church to transform its practices. The same with the playground litigation in the US. I'm wondering where, where, the, where the categories lie, because I think that that litigation can be framed in a way which is very similar to institutional reform litigation. And when? Let's take two more questions and then we'll... Just quickly going back to the exchange between Bill and Everaldo towards the end of the panel. Um, in this particular case on healthcare, um, I wonder whether the problem was not that the claims were disorganized, but that they were too organized and fragmented, meaning that there were associations of patients that, for example, but in Colombia are called high-cost patients, right? People demanded branded drugs, uh, that one, because and sometimes these associations are bankrolled by big uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, but of course, you have similar associations of patients for other illnesses, and you have physicians' associations pulling in different directions. So, in the particular case of Colombia, I was wondering what your take was on this, and, in, and, and to build more generally, uh, what the effect of, uh, of a highly mobilized but fragmented civil society that uh, litigates these cases. And, and impact on experimentalism. What, what did, what, what, would you say that last sentence again? Yeah, uh, so the general question is uh, what happens when uh, the case is that not, not that the civil society and the, the organization, the, the plaintiffs are disorganized, uh, but that they're highly organized, but uh, pulling in different directions. There's lots of antagonism interests, yeah. uh, yeah. economic interests going in different directions. Uh, and of course, trying to influence the court to go uh, in different directions as well. Third question. So, if I can build on Cesar's question, uh, Everaldo, what do you th was there a potential at some earlier time when this litigation was all using the individual chitanas to bring together? these fragmented associations and bring something that would have been more like a collective litigation. Um, wasn't that a realistic option and in a sense as, as Manuel was talking about the Ecuadorian judges, was there a missed opportunity of time at which this could have been turned into a collective litigation that would then have led to the kind of structural relief litigation that Bill was talking about. And I'll just say as a footnote that I agree with the comment. I think the line you've drawn between these two types of litigation, although it's helpful in some respects in calling our attention to different factors, um, I think it's, it's a line, it, if it ever was a real line, it is uh, decreasingly so. Um, the healthcare litigation in Colombia is, of course, litigation about money. And when you invite stakeholders in, you are creating a political process, whether you put that in a court framework or not. And the litigation in Ecuador was, yes, in part lawyers and lawyers who were looking to make money, but it was also in part indigenous people who were looking for some kind of remedy that they had not gotten in the earlier process because of the capture of the earlier process. So I think it's a mistake to draw these lines and say, this is this and that's that, and I think it's even more of a mistake to say, and this is the good, this is kind of the good theory, and this is the bad theory. So that's, that's reverse argument. Yeah. So I got one, so I'll be quick. Um, 
and I'll make a comment about that was the point. So, the, what's for the judges? And uh, that, that's, it's really, really interesting that you, you mention it because I, I will teach a concentrated version of my Chevron course next week, and, and that's one of the assignments. I hope you will post this on YouTube before next week. So I ask the students to reflect on what is, what's in for the judges. Because at this point, what there is out there, is number one, there is an Ecuadorian judgment that uh, plaintiffs are seeking to enforce in Canada. Last week, the Canadian court said it's, not, it's a no-go, but they, of course, they, they will appeal. Uh, the Brazilian court hasn't said anything yet. There's an interesting ancillary proceeding in Brazil uh, because Chevron has requested the Brazilian court to take away the, away the benefit to litigate in form of pauperies uh, to plaintiffs, which is something that I didn't talk about. The, one of the big incentives that, that, that litigating groups have uh, nowadays in, in some of these jurisdictions, and certainly in Ecuador, is that the law is, 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 is very plaintiff friendly. It says, if you are not, if you demonstrate that this is something of public interest, if it's something that, that goes beyond your own interest in, in lining your pockets, uh, you will litigate cost free, you won't pay for anything. Uh, of course, I was thought, uh, that what I had in mind was the poor plaintiff, uh, not the plaintiff that has, and is, has been enjoying funding from third party funders, sophisticated funders, which is what Chevron is saying. It's saying this is not your, your you know, ordinary indigenous person that, that you see in the posters. This is a sophisticated group of people backed by these financial actors. But okay, so there's, there's that judgment. There is a, there was an attempt by a global, by a, by a, a New York federal, uh, Judge Kaplan had issued a global, in, global injunction. Before the Ecuadorian judgment was handed down, a court, a federal court in New York, issued an injunction. It was later reversed on appeal. And it, banning or, or preventing plaintiffs from enforcing any judgment that would come as a result of that proceedings. So the big question is it, related to that is, do you as judges, or should you as judges protect you as litigants, you know, in this case Chevron, when Chevron litigates, litigating overseas, and is mistreated by the courts of that particular country? The Court of Appeals said, no, you can't do that. As a matter of, there are many reasons for that. Number one, you know, there's an international company, and you have to respect the institutions, and there will be remedies down there. You don't like the remedies? Well, this is not for the courts of New York to, to the side. So that's one boundary that was set, but it's, it's far from being decided. It will pop up again. Uh, so number two, in the arbitration, in the investment arbitration realm, there is one award. There are two investment arbitration cases. Uh, number one was already decided for Chevron and Texaco against Ecuador. The, the panel ordered Ecuador to pay $96 billion, million dollars to Texaco and Chevron. The court in, in Ecuador said to the government, yes, you have to pay that. And now Chevron and Texaco are trying to enforce that in the US. And that's, but that's not a problem. That's, a, that's just a symbolic arbitration. The important one is that the ongoing one that has, so far, the, the arbitration panel has issued five interim measures and the interim measures, so this is an investment arbitration between Texaco and, and, and Chevron against the Republic of Ecuador. Uh, the underlying allegations are that the, the Republic of Ecuador incurred in denial of justice, and it is done all this corruption scheme and all that, has put the foreign investor, the US investors, in a bad position, and uh, the tribunal has ordered the Republic of Ecuador to do everything and anything in its power to prevent that judgment from being enforced. The Republic of Ecuador has said, it can't do that for several reasons. The two, for the two most important ones is, number one, I'm a sovereign, and I didn't agree to, this is not an investment, what they're talking about. And number two, there is separation of powers. How can I order a judge in my country to of not enforce his, his own decisions when, you know, I'm the ex I'm, I represent the state, and of course, you know, there is a, 
there is a state responsibility for acts of organs of the state. But it's a question that is far from being answered. Also, there is a question on whether international arbitrators are appointed or empowered to solve a dispute, a private dispute, or to deliver justice. And it seems that these arbitrators have been delivering justice because they talk about all these public values and they say, well, this is important for the functioning of the state and so on and so forth. So the question, I, I think I, I pose more questions than answers to you, but it's a very complicated issue. As we see more transnational litigation popping up, and I agree with you that it might be, I'm not as optimistic as saying that this will be the next 200 years because we might not have states in the next 200 years, but it is the, the, the near future. Uh, so one of the big tensions is, is, has to do with the role of domestic judges, the role of international judges, their proceedings uh, in you know, inter regional courts, the inter-American uh, human rights system has seen some of this, and also the role of international arbitrators. So those three uh, groups in positions of authority with jurisdiction over different uh, with different scope will be very relevant and will have to face all these tensions. And I could longer. <laughs> the, um, uh, I think it's a good point that some of the participants in the structural reform cases do have financial stakes in it, although rarely of a magnitude, well, never of a magnitude of the kind that's involved in Lago Agrio. I mean, in my experience, while one sees many dysfunctions in the structural reform cases, one rarely sees financially motivated corruption, whereas in class damage action, one sees it with some frequency. The distinction, I mean, I still want to insist, of course, all distinctions are vulnerable, but I, I still want to insist that I think there's a different dynamic involved when the primary remedy the plaintiffs seek is an ongoing restructuring solution to an ongoing problem than when they just want compensation. Although, you know, I, I realize that claims for damages, as in the Catholic sexual abuse case, do have an effect in inducing institutional reform and setting in motion processes that result in institutional reform. But I still want to insist on decisions between direct and indirect effects. In the classic structural reform case, the plaintiffs have an ongoing relationship to the program that's being administered by the defendant, and they just want to be taken more seriously in the design and operation of that program. The abused victims of Catholic sexual abuse uh, priests, I don't think view themselves as continuing stakeholders in the Catholic Church, and I don't think they have any prospect of being invited into the process of reform within the church, which of course, and no judge of course has induced or required the kind of transparency and inclusiveness in those cases that we see in the structural reform cases. And similarly, in the Laguario case, you know, as Manuel says, Texco's left, uh, Chevron, or whatever you call it, has left uh, Ecuador. They're no longer stakeholders in whatever's going on there. And their relationship largely is as a potential damage credit to, uh, uh, to these plaintiffs. Um, and then, um, so, oh, the, there was a question about antagonism about, so what happens when civil society is divided? Great, you know, that's a key question. And um, how do we, so when we say that the plaintiffs have to sign off, what do we mean by the plaintiff and who speaks for um, the plaintiffs? Um, I, I don't think there's a good answer to that, but, you know, to some extent, to the extent that it's, it's a precondition, I think, Sable and I suggested, to the most effective types of remedies in this situation, that each stakeholder has a trouble mapping her own selfish interests onto the process. This is the benign kind of uncertainty, the veil of ignorance type of uncertainty. That is, the solutions to the problems are so up for grabs that what particular solutions will mean for individual stakeholders are hard for the stakeholders to map, and therefore they have to take a more public perspective. And then the courts, the courts in that scenario, the court says, okay, you, got, you just have to agree. Um, and the court manipulates the background rules in order to pressure the parties to come to some kind of agreement without itself either, uh, without itself determining the outcome. Now, 
to some extent, of course, the court has to police the representatives who sit at the table. So there, you know, as I've all this said, it's going to have to make judgments that are going to be controversial judgments about when every significant interest is being um, represented. And it seems to me that's where the court has to put itself on the front line. And briefly, to allow the next panel to come in, um, reacting to uh, Malcolm's um, fascinating question about timing and opportunity, and when do courts uh, intervene and what happens uh, in the trajectory of policy reform that uh, governmental agencies or even Congress um, can implement. So in, in the Colombian case, I think one of the take home messages is that courts can create the necessity to reform. Uh, probably that necessity was not there previously. So the, the idea of a trajectory is created by the judicial inter intervention. But once the, the, the new trajectory is created by the court, time-wise, uh, uh, different things can happen. Uh, I can tell you, for instance, that in one case, when the court in, in, in the healthcare case uh, demanded from the government the implementation of regulatory measures aimed at um, um, updating the healthcare system, uh, per, sorry, updating the basket of healthcare services, the government carried out this new order uh, accordingly under the time that was uh, not only created by the court but discussed also with other stakeholders. But in other cases, that included major healthcare reforms, something different happened. Uh, and I call this the government kicking over the chessboard, saying, okay, let's play politics then. Uh, if you ask me to reform the financial uh, scheme for the healthcare system, I am not doing what you're asking, I'm doing something else, something bigger. I'm uh, rearranging the whole healthcare system. So now you have to the government is saying to the court, now we adjust to that new checks that I'm playing. So then the government creates another trajectory. So it's it's very uh, it's very complex and fascinating at the same time. Um, and I I will respond to uh, Cesar's and Deborah's a question uh, uh, at the same time. Um, so Cesar is um, suggesting something that. Uh, Bill already discussed uh, what happens when uh, the issue at play is not like a, an ephemeral right, but a pharmaceutical, like or hundreds of thousands of pharmaceuticals that are produced by a company or by companies. So we are not talking about here uh, free speech. We are talking about goods which are industrially produced. In these areas, mobilization can take different shapes. One of the things that I saw in my field work was precisely what you mentioned, that civil society organizations are very well organized. And that is part also of the story here, because there is not a collective action process behind the ruling. And actually, what the court did was creating a third way for class actions. And in Colombia, we have the administrative court uh, procedure that is the typical class action that you have studied. Uh, comparatively, and we have the constitutional procedure that has two ways, the individual rights to data and the uh, constitutional provision of review. But the court in this case has created a third way. So it summoned uh, hundreds of cases, analyzed these cases of individual plaintiffs demanding access to healthcare, and abstracted the institutional determinants that were driving this litigation and asked, demanded, a healthcare reform. So this third way uh, has problems, as you mentioned, and one of them is that I would say, and this may be controversial, it creates or incentivizes this um, um, hijacking of some actors because there is not like a, a class of, of um, plaintiffs behind the reform, but like a, an abstract uh, creation of um, duties. Uh, constructed by the court, then uh, there is not uh, clearly a plaintiff or a set of plaintiffs behind this process. So that leaves 
space for colonizing, and that's when experts can become uh, self-interest uh, groups, organizations. So, yeah, I will start. Okay, so before thanking our panelists, uh, I want to remind you that in 10, 15 minutes we will start our second panel. And there's food uh, outside, so we'll motivate our discussion later. <laughs> and uh, please join me in thanking our wonderful panel.
And then there's probably that there is a tremendous amount of signs in the
taking the bar. But we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I don't know. When I start when they the bar, I'm planning to do research. Like further research with the last time. Oh, the concept. So we'll see. Okay. Now what's your topic of it? It's kind of. Uh, generally, it's like uh, competition. I would just <laughs> search engine competition in two sided market. So it's like with, uh, uh, Google and uh, kind of how search engine is going to be a monopoly. And how uh, it's kind of like indirect, whatever the paper written is, so like indirect network effect. That would affect like uh, telephones more valuable than uh, uh, the indirect is that, uh, and that's like the kind of thing. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Do you like to live in? Yeah, I think it will be a change. Yeah, it's going to be huge. Yeah. So we'll see. I think, uh, I think I'm going to go into the video or go back to the video. Because I was, uh, I don't know if it's five or five or five. I guess. And we'll see if it's five or five. So where are we going? Where are we going? So 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 where are we going? You're from the East Coast? I'm from you're from the so that's part of the that's part of the yeah, yeah. part of the yeah. Yeah. the yeah. <laughs> that's part of the <laughs> yeah. Get out of the yeah. I was brought in the fall and then after that I was like, you know, to see it's incredible. Six hours to, to get there. Five hours. Because of the chips. Yeah, we get up. What you doing for you? How are you managing for you? No, I'm just fine. I'm looking forward to it. We'll see. I don't know if I want to do like New York for the last time. But for like a couple of years, I'll just go for it.
at the University of the Andes, Colombia. He's a founding member of the Center for Law, Justice, and Society, the Justicia. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, a master uh, from the New York University Institute of for Law and Society, an MA in philosophy, in philosophy from the National University of Colombia, and a JD from the University of the Yeah, just studying for law. <laughs> His work focuses on the transformation of law and politics in the context of globalization. He's a leading sociological scholar in Latin America and currently a visiting professor of Harvard Law School. Uh, after Cesar, Malcolm Langford will present. He's a research fellow at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights, Faculty of Law, University of Oslo. His principal focus is on socioeconomic rights, various equality rights, judicial review in civil society, international development, and investment law. He's currently completing a thesis on the legitimacy and effectiveness of social rights adjudication. Over the last 15 years, he has worked for various universities, NGOs, UN agencies, and national human rights institutions. And he's currently a business scholar at the Center for the Study of Law and Society at UC Berkeley. Last but not least, we will have uh, Barsha E. Iengar. She's a Spills Fellow at Stanford Law School. She graduated from the University Law College in Bangalore and enrolled in a, as an advocate in India. She worked as a research associate at the Center for Law and Policy Research in Bangalore. Her areas of practice and writing have been on the rights to education, child rights, disability rights in India before the Supreme Court of India and the High Court of Karnataka. Karnataka. Currently, she's researching on social economic rights litigation in India, and for her speech thesis, she's writing on the right to food case before the Indian Supreme Court, which is what she will present today. And at the end of the presentation, we're very delighted to have Professor Hensler commenting on the panel. Professor Deborah Hensler is the Judge John Ford Professor of Dispute Resolution and Associate Dean for Graduate Studies at Stanford Law School. She has conducted leading empirical research on dispute resolution, complex litigation, class actions, and mass tort liability. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Political and Social Science. She was the director of the Stanford Center on Conflict and Negotiation from 1998 to 2003. Before joining Stanford Law School, she was a professor at the University of Southern California, Gould School of Law and filled a variety of high-level positions and at grant. Uh, so, each panelist will have 15 minutes to make the presentation, and then we will turn over to Professor Hensler, who will provide general com comments on the presentation in about 10 and 15 minutes. We will be a little bit stricter with the time, because we have a bigger panelist. Then we will open the floor for the panelists. Cesar. Thank you, Diego, and thanks everyone for coming today. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, very, so very comfortable. It's the first time in a long time that when they say I have a PhD in sociology and also an ADHD, someone shows his thumbs up, so Lauren goes like this. And <laughs> in Colombia, my own law school, I guess, is fish with books. So, <laughs> so this is home. Uh, and, um, and I wanted to say something about the title of today's uh, event Constitutional Innovation in the Global South, because I fully agree with what Bill said towards the end of his comments that uh, a lot of innovation is going on in the global south, in, in Asia, Latin America, and many countries in Africa. That's pretty exciting in inspirational terms, and also it uh, offers a lot of interesting uh, subjects for uh, social legal research. Uh, and it's exciting to be here to make sense of this with some of the scholars in the US who have influenced our work in Latin America or in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, now, this has been going on for 20 years now. So it's been, it's been going on at least the, the, the sort of the hallmark and the high water point that many people point to is the 1994 constitution in South Africa. But some other constitutions, of course, you had Eduardo here, so you know all about the Colombian constitution. Of course, now he made sure that you were indoctrinated in Colombian constitutional uh, law. But that was until recently uh, a less known experience. Uh, but to me, as, as, uh, as interesting, actually, uh, it's coming from a more activist or more proactive, more experimental sport, 
than is the case in, in South Africa. And of course, we all know what the partially we're going to talk about the Indian court, uh, some exciting new developments in the Kenyan Supreme Court, because of actually the second uh, trend that I wanted to highlight in my introductory comments is that there's a lot of diffusion going on uh, across the global south. So for example, uh, the South African constitutional model has been highly influenced, uh, influential in uh, other uh, jurisdictions like Kenya. Uh, we in Latin America know about the big cases in India and South Africa, and actually those models are being actively copied when there's a constitutional transition. So all of this makes for very exciting uh, legal progress, but also interesting uh, objects for social legal research. For example, um, and as part of this package that gets diffused throughout the world, there are two core elements that are usually there in the mix. One is a general bill of socioeconomic rights. Right, so the second bill of rights that Hans Hansen uh, describes in his book, we have that incorporated virtually in every constitution.